Hi, this is Henry Sanders from Madison 365 for another episode of Real Talk. And I'm here with a good friend of mine from Sun Prairie, Cardinal Country. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Monty Bowie, live in Sun Prairie, family of five and a dog. And a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and a dog. Uh, so, you being from Sun Prairie, mm-hmm. tell us a bit about you, because a lot of our viewers probably don't know you, yeah. but I met you before. So, tell us a bit about you, who you are, where you're from. Gotcha. So, um, I, I moved to Sun Prairie, good grief, probably about eight years ago through uh, corporate moves, uh, just promotions. Started really uh, living here many years ago and went to, to, to work here as an account executive for a pharmaceutical company and also was doing uh, my MBA at the same time, so going back and forth. Uh, when I finished that, I had an opportunity to go back to Chicago for a job. Took that role, uh, left Sun Prairie, and you know wasn't really sure that I was ever coming back. But I, I had so many positive opportunities in Madison and really enjoyed it. Um, but went to Chicago, got married, uh, worked for a company you're probably familiar with, Covance, for a few years, mm-hmm. um, and through through promotions and matriculation, really went from Indianapolis from Chicago to Indianapolis, Indianapolis back to Chicago. So I'd done it single. Now I was really doing it um, in, in Madison or Sun Prairie area as a, as a family man, came here with one child. And what really happened is over, over the time of me being here, my wife fell in love with the place. She fell in love with growing our relationships, fell in love with our, our church. And, and then when we had the opportunity to move and we were thinking about moving, it really came down to, you know, there's a lot of places we could go. But this place keeps calling us back. People actually want us here. So we decided to put our, 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 our roots in the ground. And so about a year and a half, year and a half, year and a half, maybe a little bit longer ago, we built a home. And so when we built a home, it was really our way of staying. And wherever we were going to go and wherever we were going to be, we made the decision that we were going to put our hands in the community. It wasn't going to be that we just went here and our kids went to school here and then we left. It was how can we get involved? Heartland was a great jumping off point for that for us to get involved. And then we were always looking for other things. My wife coaches basketball. I coached a little for my for my young son. And it was, how do you get your hands in the community? How do you do the things that you say you want this community to be? And so when this opportunity came up for me, I decided to run for school board. Well, it sounds like you're busy with five kids and a, and a dog. Three three kids and a oh, dog. Okay. So three family. kids three yeah. kids and a dog. Mm-hmm. So you're busy. You yeah. travel a lot for your job. Yep, right? significant amount. And then you decide... <laughs> to run for school board mm-hmm. in one of the highest growing places in the state of Wisconsin. You got it. Why would you want to do that? Because my promise to help my community was greater than my busy schedule. And I don't know about you, and I, and I mean this. First of all, I, I have two, two, two ways to resolve the busy thing, right? First of all, if your wife tells you you're not busy enough and you can do it, you can do it. That's number one. Number two, do you know people that aren't busy to actually get things done? Not really. Yeah. They're usually busy, yeah. and that's why they get things done. Yeah. So I've heard that before, but that's really what it boils down to. If Mama says it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, yeah. I mean, that's you know, a lot of people when you work for school board, such a tough, tough, tough job mm-hmm. because you can never make people happy in the role. You know, why? Why do you at this time for the school board? In some prayer, because you, if you win, you'd be the only second black probably ever to do that, right? Marilyn Ruffin was she's there That's now, correct. right? Right, you'd be the first black male to my knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, why do it? Well, th- there's there's a ton of reasons, really, when you think about it. First of all, you got to understand this isn't about me or my family. At the end of the day, we go to a wonderful school, we live in a wonderful community, and I think they're going to be okay. This is about the people that aren't going to be okay. This is about the families that don't feel like they have anyone to represent them. And this is about figuring out a way for people to be a little more transparent. And it's really about communication. What I, what I try to tell people is that transparency builds trust, right? Mm-hmm. And if you can build that trust, then you can start to build a community. And so we moved here because it was a good community. And we want to build on that. And I think we're at that, that really challenging place, that really troublesome place where if we don't start building that out and figuring out how to, how to communicate and this growth trajectory that we're in, we're never going to have it. We're never going to have it. So I want to be a part of fixing that problem. You, you, do you, being black, do you think that that plays a role in you? Because, you know, Sun Prairie has the percentage-wise has more blacks than Madison. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't know that, right? When I grew up, Sun Prairie was a place that— Yeah, it's probably about 30% or so now. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's extremely high. Do you think you being a black man 
helps you connect to that growing population? I think it should. I, I think it should. And I think more importantly, coming from a from a mixed family mm-hmm. and also coming from an environment where I've, I've lived and breathed in corporate America where I was the only African-American in the building most of the time. When they when they saw you, they either thought you were, were dropping off something or that you weren't staying. Right. So I'm, I'm familiar with what that feels like. I'm also familiar with what that feels like to be in a school system like that, because when I grew up in St. Louis, I went to a school where the numbers were were, were, were not as not as high in Sun Prairie. So I was one of a handful of blacks in the desegregation program. So I know what it feels like for kids to walk in and not understand how to connect with teachers, not understand how to behave in a particular neighborhood and how to walk out of there feeling like you're proud and that you you're a part of the school. And I want to help them get through that. I think it can be done. I, I think I think it has to come from a, a host of different avenues, right? I think the teachers have to understand that the kids are going through that. I think that administrators have to understand that the kids are going through that. And I think the parents have to understand that your kids are being put in this environment where perhaps if you haven't coached them on how to do that or how to move through through this arena, that, that you might need some help. And I want to be that help. I, I don't think anybody gets off the hook in helping these kids figure this out. I think it's everybody in the community that has to rally together and say this is important and we have to do this. Well, what would you say the top three issues are for, for the Sun Prairie School District right now? Well, it's interesting. I, I, I think everyone would point to the referendum right now where they're thinking about building two high schools. But that's not the issue. The issue is growth, right? And so I think the growth is the issue. And a lot of things sit under that growth issue, right? So if you think about uh, overcrowding of schools, that's become uh, a really challenging aspect. I think the equity conversation is a challenging aspect. I think the equity issue with, with the way the school is growing is real. But I think the way that we are addressing it um, needs to be a little bit more robust and it needs to involve a lot more people. But they have to have the heart to do it. This isn't this isn't a complaint about, well, we keep using equity as a way to uh, to let kids that aren't performing well get off the hook. That's not it. I think the equity conversation is real, but it's not just about color. It's about economics as well. And so all of that has to come into that conversation. So if you ask me, it's really around growth, right? It's, it's growth. It's around school safety. Uh, and it's around the equity issue. And as a school board member, how would you address some of those issues? You know, I think the first thing we have to do is start listening and make sure the right people are at the table. I, gosh, I, I, I probably talked to, I'm going to guess, no, no smaller than 40 teachers. They don't feel like they're at the table. So I want to make sure that they have a seat at the table when we're having this conversation. And I want, to th- I want to make sure that we build on the momentum that, to be honest, the school district has just started to do um, with, with a group that they're working with called the Pacific Group, right? So they're, they're entrenched into the school district, and they're doing a lot of this work on helping people understand the equity conversation. But I, I'm concerned about the momentum. I think we have to keep that momentum up, and I think we also have to have the community as part of that conversation. This is real, and people can say, well, this is an excuse for people not performing, or whatever the case may be. And what I can tell you is that I perform exceptionally well at my job. But it's still an issue. I do know where the obstacles stand that keeps me to get from the next stage of my job. And so I would say that globally, this is still an issue. And we have to have a conversation if we really want this community to thrive. What I feel about it, so, you know, I see it in some parade or a little on there, mm-hmm. is that the community is growing and they don't know how to deal with the growth. Mm-hmm. But the underlying issues, what no one will say, is that there's also a population of color that's coming in and they don't know how to deal with the different cultures that are coming into their to the area. How do you, as some prairie, as a, a place like some prairie that historically has been extremely white, culturally white, uh, I love the I love some prairie. But how do you how do you deal with the different cultures coming in and make sure that they can still thrive in a school system that historically has not been built for them? Right. Um, I I honestly, for me and my family, the way we've done it is our dinner table. And, and anybody that knows me knows that this is true, that we use our home as that place to bring those cultures together so that people are talking, people are having the kind of conversations that we're having to be able to go out in the community and say, well, wait a minute, maybe things aren't exactly how we think they are. And I think it really starts on those small little uh, micro scales, right, where you're having those kind of conversations. This, to, to me, I don't think you get a big push until you start changing people's hearts. And this isn't, this isn't an analytical question anymore. The data already, has already proven the argument that we're all having about equity, about, about how kids are performing of color, 
And, and so I, I think we're past the point where data is the thing. I think we have to start changing hearts and, and people that love this community in order to see it grow. Because you're not going to have the growth without having the diversity. Otherwise, I don't know where you're going to get it from, right? So if it's the growth you want, if it's the new Costco you want, if it's the new movie theater you want, you have to get comfortable with some of the other things. And I think that there's much more that we have in common than, than the differences that we can continue to talk about and address. And so I want to focus on those commonalities. How is your family dealing with all this? You mentioned send out to dinner table. You got, <laughs> you know, you got the kids, the dog, the wife. Uh, you know, how does how do they take this? You know, someone who's running for office. Yeah. When you're running for office, your whole family is running with office with you. Absolutely. How did you convince your wife and your family that this was the thing to do? Henry, you know my wife. She convinced me. <laughs> so, so first of all, you got to know this. I've known my wife since I was. 14 years old mm -hmm. and so so there's no there's no questions like I can give her a look or she can give me a look and it's pretty much a done deal but what I did is before I decided to run and people started to nudge me about this you know everybody's got their own what would you call it uh your own own board of directors you go to to ask tough questions right and I think I even sent you a note and you were and I said I got a serious question for me you're like are you safe <laughs> right but I, but apparently not I'm a little crazy but when, when this all started, I asked a, a handful of people, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. And the intention is to find somebody to tell me no. Like, and I, I went deep to try to find people to tell me no. And every last one of them said, Monty, I think you should do this. I think you're the right person for the job. And these are people I trusted. I even went, I even went to the deepest place I could go and I asked my mama. And I couldn't get my mama to talk me out of it. So I'm here because... A lot of my community uh, has, has supported me and, and su suggested that I do this. It wasn't it wasn't something I thought of in a, in, a, in a bubble. What do you like about campaigning, and what don't you like about campaigning? Man, I like the strategy of campaigning. Um, I don't like that part where you have to pull the trigger and, and print something out, and then you have to go and sort of figure out who to give it to, and you know you're you're forcing somebody to read material about you. I don't I don't necessarily like that part of it. But I love the discussions, man. I love having conversations with people and them having that suspicious feeling of you. And then after talking to you or knowing your family, um, just getting a sense that they've kind of bought, bought in. And you know, you asked the question earlier about my family. So remember, when I started this, this whole journey, I didn't, I didn't have the intention of running. And then all of a sudden, this thing was coming up on me pretty quickly. So when they decided that they were going to have a day in which you pick the ballot, uh, which, where you would sit on the ballot... I didn't go. I was on a, on a trip. I was, I was already planning a trip. So I had to go. My family went in my stead. Oh. And so as they were saying, well, who's going to pick and who's going to introduce you? My 11-year-old daughter's like, Mama, I got this. So if you asked about my family, they're, they're game. They're ready. Wow. And some prayer is a different uh, election process than the Madison School District, Correct. right? So what, what's that process? So so w with us, you, you had to have the, the amount of, of signatures, right? So I think you had to have about 100 signatures. So that was the first step. And you find out a lot about about who knows you and who, you, who doesn't know when you go out and you try to get those signatures. You get those signatures, and then it's really about um, after you've been confirmed, you go in and you select where you're going to be on the ballot. I'm number three, by the way. Um, but but after you take after you do that, really, it's it's open season for you to start campaigning, right? So you don't you don't actually go against a, a, one opponent. It's not a seat, correct? Right. You are are on the board. It's not a specific seat on the board. So it's the top three people get in, right? So there are there are three incumbents and uh, three additional individuals running. So there's six six to select from. Um, I'm one of those six, clearly. Wow. Well, well, congratulations. I think. <laughs> If you win, we'll see how you feel about that. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's a tough, tough gig, man. It's I, a tough, I, I it's hear. A tough, tough gig. But when you, when's the last time you did something that was really worth it that wasn't tough? That's a good point. That's that's a good word. That's yeah. actually for the good young people out there. That's a good word. So I've been asking every candidate this. Mm -hmm. Some prairie has some of the disparities that Madison does. Yeah. Right. Sell our audience or a people you know, a, a person of color, a mom, a dad. Why put their kids in the Sun Prairie School District? Why trust them with some disparities and challenges Sun Prairie has? So, so what I would say is if you trust yourself as a parent, 
to actually parent, Sun Prairie is a great place for you. There's some, the, the opportunities that your children will get in the Sun Prairie School District and the community that, that's there to welcome them is fairly vast. It's more, probably more vast than you possibly imagine. Um, so for those reasons alone, because of the opportunities within the school system, and the, there are wonderful educators within the school system as well, and also that there's a group of people that are wel- there, like my family, wel- re- ready to welcome you and help you make it through the, through the district. So those are the reasons I would I would come. And in fact, if you ask me, I'd do it again today. And I've been in the school district for seven years. Oh, you're a salesperson. That was a good sales <laughs> pitch. That was a good elevator pitch. I actually should take some notes here. <laughs> but that was good. Uh, so let the people know, you know about you and why they should vote for you. So my, my, my job really, as I see it as a school board, is to, to help people communicate better and help encourage people to solve problems together. So if that's your intention... If you're actually ready to solve problems and sit down and not necessarily pick sides, but bring people to the table to solve these problems together, problems such as issues around equity, issues around how we plan for growth, how we reward our teachers better, how we get teachers of color in our school, I believe I'm your candidate. I I think I represent a lot of the kids that went through some of the challenges that we're we're saying today as 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 a son of a mom that was a single parent. Uh, and watching her struggle and ha- having to, to go to schools where I was often um, uh, one of only a handful of people that looked like me. Uh, I understand what your child's going through, but I also understand that there's a lot of opportunity there uh, for them to capture, and I want to help them capture that. That's good. Thank you. And thank you for coming on, bro. Indeed. Good luck to you, man. Thanks for coming on, keeping it real with us on Real That's Talk. Fun. Talk to you soon.